Bull Doobie, he's here in uh, Las Vegas. <coughs> a few considerations of his uh, passion of St. Luke and of his Holy First Amendment. This Wednesday of Holy Week, tonight, and tomorrow, Holy Thursday, the Church considers in a special way three characters, which is St. Peter and St. John and Judas. But especially we consider Judas. And we consider the Judas that one of the points is made in the sacred scripture during the tenebrae, which would be uh, sung tomorrow morning or tonight, if there's a bishop doing a uh, chrism mass, the tenebrae is sung tonight. No bishop doing a chrism mass, the tenebrae is sung tomorrow morning. And then the office of Matins for Holy Thursday. When we have this, uh, this consideration of the this uh, mystery of Judas. And it says in the sacred liturgy with the bravery tomorrow morning that uh, Judas, that St. Peter and the apostles sleep. That Judas, Judas works. And here we are in the day of this Holy Palm Sunday was a day of the great victory of Christ, or so it seemed. And now he Good Friday was a day of his great defeat. And in between what happens? One thing we to consider is that notice the stages of the fall of Judas. Judas the priest. And as Judas continues to go down, so the world goes down. Until eventually Judas makes his greatest fall, and then there shall be the greatest fall of all in the world. So it is the priests who will say on Good Friday morning, let him be crucified. It is the priests who will get the people to say, let his blood be upon us, upon our children. Is the priests that are the most responsible for the act of the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. But priests of both testaments. The high priests of the Old Testament named Caiaphas. And the priests that were under him. And the priests of the New Testament named Judas. And Simon Peter. And the priests that were under him. Who brought about the death of Christ? God willed, says St. Paul, that there be a mediator. He made there to be a priest who is a mediator. He is a mediator between God and man. One day, Jacob, the father of the priest, Israel, Jacob, he was on his way, running away from his brother Esau, and he had just received the great blessing of his priesthood, the great blessing to become the great-grandfather of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Messiah, of the, of the, of the Messiah of St. Joseph. He received that blessing from his father, and he had to flee. As soon as he got that blessing, he had to flee. And this is the mystery of priesthoods. For many are blessed. But when that first priest who died was blessed, his name was Abel. And how was Abel's blessing? How was his priesthood sanctified? Because he offered a worthy sacrifice to God, and he was killed. And so from the very beginning, priesthood and death, Priesthood and fleeing, priesthood and suffering can never be separated. And that's the way God made things. In the very beginning, before Adam fell, there would be no suffering for the priest. There would be no suffering for men. But Adam the priest decided to turn against God. He decided to listen to Eve. And she decided to listen to the serpent. And he decided to commit the great sin of pride. And thereby, their priesthood was harmed. And he was no longer able to be that mediator between God and man. It was broken. How could it be put back? There had to be Abel, the shepherd that would die. And then Jacob. Jacob fled. And he was afraid. He had that great turmoil in his heart that his spiritual and physical sons would have. His physical sons would have this great turmoil. For all these apostles are his sons. And they're also his spiritual sons because they're going to be the, the fathers and the priests and the bishops of the New Testament. And they had such great turmoil when they fled, when they went into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. They thought they were going to die. Because of the fact that they said with Thomas, who we mentioned the other day, on, 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 on Palm Sunday itself, or Saturday before Palm Sunday, they said that they, were, they knew they were going to die when they went into Jerusalem. Because our St. Thomas said, let us go and let us die with him. And they went with fear to Jerusalem. They had just seen Christ weeping on the top of Mount Olivet. And now they go with great fear and yet confidence, we're going to die with Christ. We're going to die with Christ. And instead of dying, they threw palms before the feet. And they had turmoil in their heart. And they experienced one half 
of the mystery of the priesthood, Jacob with fear and Jacob with joy ran away from his brother Esau. He had joy because he had that blessing. He had fear because Esau was going to kill him and he was alone. And he was exhausted in spirit and he fell asleep. And he put his head upon a rock that looked like a piece of bread in a place that he would call Bethel, which means bread. And then he saw that ladder. The ladder going up to heaven. And he saw the angels coming down the ladder and the angels going up the ladder. And they were bringing the blessings from heaven to the earth and earth to heaven. And God determined, as Adam, as he had said, Jacob, Isaac said to his son Israel, who would become Israel, he was Jacob the usurper, Jacob the liar, Jacob the cheat, Jacob the one that took his birthright from his brother, Jacob the coward that ran away from, from uh, was afraid to get a blessing. That's the Jacob who lays down at that rock. But he will become Israel. Somehow his cowardice will go away. And he's going to fight an angel throughout the whole of the night. Because an angel won't tell him his name. And in the morning, the angel is going to say, You're a pretty tough guy. You followed me all night. But let me give you an idea about how strong I am and how strong you are. And the angel took his finger and he touched the hip of Jacob, the priest, Jacob, the bishop, Jacob, the father of the priesthood of the 12 tribes, Jacob, our spiritual father. And an angel took his, touched the hip of, of, of uh, Jacob, whom he had fought with the entire night. He touched with his finger, and the hip shrunk. And for the remainder of his days, Jacob limped. He could never walk straight again for the rest of his days. His ship shrunk by the touch of a finger of an angel with whom he had fought. And here is the mystery of our holy priesthood. God decided, he said, I, you, uh, the heavens and the nations shall be blessed in you, and the blessings shall be cursed in you. And so what is this mystery of Wednesday of Holy Week, the day we are today? It is a day in which you contemplate the mysterious priesthood of Judas Iscariot. He was a son of Judah. He was a cousin of our Lord Jesus Christ by the son of Judah. There were only two Judeans amongst those 13, and one of them was Judas from Cariot, and the other one was Jesus Christ. And the other 10, the other, the other, the other 11, were all from Galilee. God said, I'm going to bless the people in the priest. I'm going to curse the people in the priest. Who bless it? And then what happened? Caiaphas turned against God. The Sadducees and the Pharisees turned against God. The Pharisees were not priests. They were trying to take the place of priests because priests were not doing their duty. We have new Pharisees in the church today. The Pharisees originally, they were good. They were not originally bad. They were laymen who were filling in because the priests weren't doing their job. These are the laymen now experts on the internet. They study philosophy. They study St. Thomas Aquinas. They are experts in Latin and they know all the readings of the fathers of the church. And they know all the readings of the Pope. And they are the Pharisees of our times. Not all the Pharisees are wicked. But what happened to the Pharisees, they became filled with great pride. And they took the place of the priests because the priests were not doing their job. Well, why did Pharisees have to fill in that gap? Because the priests were corrupt. And because the priests were wicked. Just this last weekend, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, a young man says to me, look, Father, I want to know my faith well. The priests aren't teaching it to me. I want to learn St. Thomas. I can't learn it from the priests. So I'm going to learn it from Taylor Marshall. I get a little, little letter that says, I got, the, I got the Summa Theologica Certificate. And I'm going to learn it from these guys who are serious about the faith. Now, they are not all bad. But they are taking the place of the Pharisees, and the Pharisees are not priests, and God does not speak through the Pharisees. He speaks through the priests. But the priests have turned wicked. The priests have turned against God. But he will still speak through the priests. And on this day, Wednesday, and on the day tomorrow, Thursday, our Lord Jesus Christ is going to die for the whole world. Who does he talk to? Palm Sunday, he speaks to all the people. Palm Sunday, he goes before everyone. Today and tomorrow, 
After he had a little talk in the temple later or earlier today, it's now the night time of Wednesday. And from this moment on, until Jesus Christ dies, he will speak only to his priests. Everything depends upon the priests. Blessed Virgin Mary told us that a little while ago when she said the Pope, the priest, he must consecrate Russia, the Magna Heart of Mary, the Holy Father, who has decided to close down the Vatican because of a virus that doesn't exist. We were trying to close down the Vatican because we don't need, because God can't fix viruses. There are 380 trillion viruses in every human body. 380 trillion. Who put them there? God. Who knows the number of them? God. We know the approximate number. He knows the exact number. And he, knows, he knows the name of every one of those stinking viruses. He knows a lot more than these foolish scientists, these foolish doctors. He knows about the virus. He knows about everything. The priest is the answer to the troubles today and not the layman. And the priest is the answer to the troubles today in the church and the world. The priest must stand up before God and do his duty again. He needs to be converted. He needs to come back to God. And today is the day on Wednesday of Holy Week when we consider the very busy priest. And his name is Judas from Cariot. Now what happened to him? Six days before the Pasch. First of all, we see him in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6, about a year before. And what happens? Christ feeds the 5,000. And then he says, the next day, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And, and then what happens? St. John the Apostle notes, and Judas the traitor was there. He began to be a traitor when Christ said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And also our Lord said, blessed is he that is not scandalized in me. Now it's a terrible thing to be scandalized in Christ. But who is the most terrible one that is scandalized in Christ? He is the priest. And Judas the priest, who had the power to perform miracles, who was trusted enough to handle the money to give out to the poor, who was one of the chosen apostles, sat right next to Christ at the Last Supper. He sat at his right side at the Last Supper. The closest one to Christ physically. He was a very wise apostle. He spoke in the name of the apostles on Saturday before the Holy Week. And he said, what purpose is this waste? It could have been given to the poor. But how did he begin his fall? This man has makes no sense. He's not bringing the people to God the right way. He's using the wrong tactics. He's too offensive. He's not the kind of man that we want. This is not the way to win the people. You fed them bread yesterday, and now you say, eat my flesh and drink my blood. They ask for an explanation. You give them no explanation. They all leave, and they are disgusted, and disgust enters the heart of Judas, the priest, and he begins to fall. He becomes a thief. He turns his love away from God, and he turns his love to money. But he has not yet completed his fall. In the Gospel of St. Luke today, we have the second entrance of Satan. St. John will mention the third entrance of Satan. St. John mentions the first entrance of Satan and the third. And St. Luke mentions the second entrance. He's in the Gospel to the Passion today. The first entrance was when... Christ prophesied that he was going to be flesh and blood. And this is offensive to everyone, but especially to the priest. And why is this? Because God said in the New Testament, the priest is both the victim and the, sac and the priest. At the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, the priest is the one that offers the sacrifice. He's the one that kills the victim. He's the one that consumes the victim. The one that destroys the victim and thereby makes it a worship act to God. But he is also the victim itself. He has to be, his blood must be shed. For in the New Testament priesthood, the priest must be both priest and victim. And this is a scandal to the priest. It is a scandal to the priest. We go around to give you Christ, we go around to give you the truth, and things don't work out. It doesn't work the way we expect. And we get discouraged. It's not supposed to be that way. And yet Christ determined that there must be scandal, and there must be difficulties, and there must be collapses, and there must be failures, and there must be wounds. And he's teaching 11 out of 12. He's trying to teach 12, but one won't listen, and that's Judas. 
He has the first fall when he said when he, Christ scandalizes him and he's disgusted with Christ. And when Christ stops being his Lord and he starts becoming a teacher, he has that first distancing from Christ. You have many good things to say. You're a great preacher. You really know how to talk. You have many good things to say. And I believe the things you say, but this is ridiculous. Telling the people, eat my flesh and drink my blood. This is foolishness. You're driving the souls away. It's not the way it's supposed to be. And Judas steps away from Christ. But he's still there. Then comes the day of the great scandal, which is Saturday, a couple days ago. Right before Palm Sunday, the day of the great scandal. Because on this day, Mary Magdalene comes in, who is already a saint in her heart, who has left behind her sins, and she breaks the alabaster oil on the feet of our Lord. And all the apostles are scandalized, not just Judas. St. Matthew points it out, as is also St. Luke. Not just Judas. And Judas speaks out on behalf of all the apostles and says, To what purpose of this waste? With great indignation, with such feeling in his voice, this man cares about the poor. And as Bishop Sheen says, Whenever the priest leaves, and not only the priest, but man leaves individual justice. That is, he no longer cares about his soul in the state of grace. He no longer cares about the faith being inside his mind and heart as the most important thing. When he gives up on individual justice, he becomes interested in social justice. He talks about social justice on Saturday. That's what Judas did. This could have been soul of the poor. Get out there and do something. Help the poor. Open soup kitchens. Because after all, didn't Jesus Christ come to end poverty? He came to end suffering. He forgot about the Sermon on the Mount. When Christ said at the very beginning, Go tell John the Baptist. You're still following John the Baptist when you should be following me. Well, go tell John the Baptist what you've seen and heard. Behold, the blind see. The deaf hear. The lame walk. And the poor stay poor. The poor don't get rich. Blind see, lame walk, deaf hear, but the poor stay poor. For the poor have the gospel preached unto them. That's the answer to poverty. The answer to poverty is the gospel. The answer to poverty is not a check from Trump. The answer to poverty is not your, 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 your uh, unemployment check. Besides, if you've been out on un un work for 18 months, you're no longer unemployed. You're post-unemployed. So you don't get the check. I've been looking at my check for years now. I don't get my check. <laughs> the fact is, if you're not unemployed anymore, you don't get the check. The answer to poverty is not the check from the government, which came from the Federal Reserve. The answer is the gospel. That's the answer to poverty. And he scandalizes Judas. And then St. Matthew tells us, and Judas was shocked. Or rather, St. Mark tells us yesterday, and Judas was shocked. She wasted this. And he went to the priests. That's when Judas went to the priests. So on Saturday, Judas saw the alabaster order break. He saw the 300 denarii be wasted. And he went to the priests. And he has his second level of Satan entering him. And also St. Luke says, And Satan entered Judas, and he went to the priests, and he said, I will betray him. And they were rejoicing. And the priests rejoiced. You're one of his disciples. You're one of the actual twelve that's always around him. Look at that. Why do they rejoice? Even his own friends can't take him anymore. Mm. And they're willing to sell him for 30 pieces of silver. And so the Caiaphas, the priest, forgot about the mount because the Caiaphas forgot his faith. Caiaphas forgot his priesthood, and Caiaphas was filled with Satan. And when he was filled with Satan, darkness covered his intellect because every Jewish child knew the teaching of the Old Testament concerning the Messiah. Everybody knew that one day, said the prophet Zechariah, they have prized me the price of a saint, and they have sold me for 30 pieces of silver. He knew that, that Christ would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. He forgot. 
And he made a deal with Judas to hand over this man for 30 pieces of silver. He forgot what everyone knew. And today, we are in an age as Christ is about to be crucified, where everyone has forgot what everyone knows. We have forgotten what Judas is like. We have forgotten what Caiaphas is like. We have forgotten what Pilate and Herod are going to do. Trump may be a really good guy, at least as good as Pilate. And what's going to happen? Put confidence in him. For it says, St. Luke points out, Trump said to Christ, I don't want to crucify you. And he wanted to work things out. He was trying to work against the liberals. He was trying to work for the conservatives. He was trying to save America and make Israel great again. That's what he was going to do. And he wasn't going to allow this injustice to happen. And he spoke to Christ, and he spoke to Christ, and he spoke to Christ, and he spoke to the crowds, and he spoke to the crowds, and he spoke to the crowds, and he spoke the truth. I find no blood, and no injustice in this man. Yesterday Trump said, you know, we're going to look very hard at this World Health Organization. We're going to decide whether or not we're going to keep funding them. When they do good things, okay, but they got it all wrong this time. We're going to look hard at it. Isn't that encouraging? And so there you are in the crowd with the holy women. And there you are in the crowd with, with, with the eleven apostles. Pilate said he finds no cause in him. Isn't that comforting? Don't you think the Jew Israel is going to become great again? It's so comforting. And Judas, we forget that man is going to get his comeuppance. I heard that he's getting ready to commit suicide. And sure enough, he got his just desserts. He's dead before noon. Did you hear about Judas hanging from a tree? That's right. We're going to get justice now. Judas is hanging from a tree, and Hillary is hanging from a tree, and Pelosi is hanging from a tree, and Clinton's hanging from a tree. You got a list? We need more trees than there are in the forests <laughs> to hang all those scumbags from. We need a lot of trees. And look at that. They're all hanging from a tree. Everything's fine, especially Judas. That's why we gotta get Pope Francis. He's wicked. We gotta get Cardinal Mahoney. He's wicked. We gotta get all the bad bishops and all the bad cardinals. Let them all hang from the trees. And when they're hanging, the church is gonna be great again. And we're all gonna come back. We just gotta to explain to Pilate. We gotta to explain to Trump what's going on. There is hope. At least it wasn't Herod that was there. Imagine what would have happened if Herod was the one doing the judging. It'd be awful. But it's Pilate. We're so happy it's Pilate. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Pull out the name Pilate, put in the name Trump. Pull out the name Herod and put in George Soros. Take your pick. Have times changed? Have souls changed? Has God changed? No, he has not. And now we consider this Judas. Judas made such a big mistake. He ate that he, he was he was filled with Satan when he denied Christ. And he was filled with Satan again when he went out and happily sold Christ according to pieces of silver, like AA 1025. Like the communist infiltrators in the church. Like the Masonic infiltrators in the church in the last hundred years, and the, and the Aryan infiltrators, and all the infiltrators of the Protestants, and the infiltrators of the Gnostics, and the infiltrators of every heretic and Satanist of the last 2,000 years, and guess how long there's going to be infiltrators with 30 pieces of silver in their pocket? Until the day of judgment. Go to Rome and check the pockets. They're going to jingle with 30 pieces everywhere to pay off the national debt with the money in their pockets. The fact is, Judas is still Judas, and Judas was there with the apostles. And everything they thought was, was getting better when Palm Sunday ended, and Christ strangely cursed that tree on Monday, and then the tree was found withered on Tuesday because he wanted a fig. He's such a patient Jesus. He's always patient, and he never worries about food. And on Monday of Holy Week, he walks by a fig tree, and he's hungry. He wants a fig. And the gospel tells us it wasn't the season for figs. Think Christ cares what season it is? He's like a real man. When a man's hungry, it doesn't matter what season it is. There better be food on the table. It doesn't matter what season it is. 
It was not the season for figs. Maybe not. But it was the season that he wanted a fig. And there was supposed to be a fig on that tree because he wanted a fig. And there was not a fig on that tree. And Christ cursed the tree. Then on Tuesday, they walked by the tree and it was dead and withered. Now today is Wednesday and they go back home. They will not return again until that supper on Thursday. And they will not return and they will never make another trip. This is their last time talking to the Jews, the last time speaking to the temple. Now they're walking back and Judas now has had it. Now he's going to put his plan in practice. He goes and speaks to the, to the soldiers, and he makes his plan to capture Christ tomorrow. And his plan is foolproof. He's going to capture him when he comes into town, because he knows he's coming to town for the feast. He knows the house where he goes to for the feast, and he has it all planned. Right now, the coronavirus is a plan. It's a plan of the Satanists. It's a plan of the deep state. It's a plan of global domination. And they've got it all planned for the new world order. And it's going to fall now. And they've got it planned for the Antichrist to come. And he's ready to come. And everything is in order. But here's the problem. Man has his plans. And God has his will. Which one wins? The next day, when Judas lays out his plan, Judas the priest, he knows the schedule. He knows everything about Christ. He knows the secrets. He has set soldiers to capture him in a certain alley that they walk down every time they go into Jerusalem. But what happens on Holy Thursday, St. Mark speaks about it yesterday, or St. Luke today speaks about it. And Christ told the apostles, Peter, James, and John, go into town. When you get into town, you're going to see a man walking with a water pot on his head. Only women do that. You're going to be in a town of two and a half million people. Walk down whatever street you want to walk down, and you're going to eventually see a man that has a water pot on his head. Only women do. Follow him. When you get to the house of that man, tell him the Lord has need of that house. Will their GPS be able to catch us? If God doesn't want us to be caught. Will the satellites catch us if God doesn't want us to be caught? It won't work. Christ went a different way than he normally went. And he had the last supper with his apostles. And Judas was angry. Now Judas had so many opportunities to repent. He saw the victory of Palm Sunday. He saw the fig tree being destroyed. He saw that his plan was thwarted by Christ without even using any effort. He's sitting there in the supper and Christ ordains him a priest. He makes him a priest. He consecrates him a bishop. And St. Luke is the one who proves that to us today in his gospel. He made him a priest. He made him a bishop. He made him say this, for often you should do these things, do them in commemoration of me. And then he said, after the first mass, after the first ordination, after the first first Holy Communion, after the first of this most beautiful of gifts of the Holy Eucharist, and the most beautiful gifts of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, and the most beautiful gifts of the priesthood that he's handed over to his apostles, and Philip says, Now thou speakest plainly, now we know that thou art the Son of God. And then our Lord, timing is always so bad. This night, one of you is going to betray me. And St. John says, the third entrance of Judas. Satan entered Judas. Now Satan was in Judas when he became a thief and was disgusted by the mass. Satan entered Judas when he went and sold Christ to the priests. And now Satan enters Judas when he becomes a priest of the New Testament, when he becomes sanctified by his holy priesthood, when he receives that sacrilegious holy communion. The first time holy communion was ever distributed, there was one that received it sacrilegiously. The first ordination had a sacrilegious priest. And he did not convert by being priest. He did not turn back to God in his New Testament priesthood. No, he did not. And then our Lord said, one of you is going to betray me. Is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? Is it I, Rabbi? He puts his finger in the cup. And Judas goes out. And Christ gives a final instruction to Judas. The instruction that's going to Satan right now. The satanic priests in our church. The satanic leaders of the world. What thou must do, do quickly. Now why does he do it quickly? Because in a few hours, he's going to be dead. 
In a few hours, he is going to be judged. In a few hours, he's going to be damned. And so it is for so many of these souls today. They're 80 years old, worshiping Satan. They're 70 years old, following Satan. They've been working their whole life with Satan. And God is going to judge them. And their days are coming to an end. And therefore, what thou must do, do quickly. And later that night, the crowd is going to come to him. The mob is going to come to him. And Christ is going to say, tonight, tonight is your hour. As Bishop Sheen says, the word hour is mentioned only seven times in the Gospel of St. John, each time referring to his crucifixion and his death, always referring to the hour of evil. When he speaks of good, he always speaks of a day. When he speaks of evil, it's an hour. For good lasts a day that is forever. Evil only for an hour. This is your hour. Satan knows his hour has come. It is the hour of Christ's passion. The hour of Christ's battle, the hour of Christ's victory, and it's the hour of the day Satan's defeat. That's the same hour. The hour in which they come to crucify us, the hour in which they try to destroy the church, as they've done for the last 2,000 years, the hour is the hour of the defeat of Satan, the hour that his time is up. So there are two ways to look at this hour. It is the hour of the devil. Judas has one hour left, and then he's going to hell. He's going to judgment. And Christ says of him, it were better for you, you had not been born. No Judas, no Caiaphas, no crucifixion. And so we look at the world today, and there are Judases, and there are Caiaphases, and the church is being crucified. But go back to Jacob's ladder. And Jacob, the terrified young man, running away, who had just usurped the birthright of his, of his brother, lays in a deep sleep in his terror, and he sees that ladder, and the angels coming down the ladder, bringing gifts from the heaven to earth, and going up, and he's strengthened by the vision of that ladder, that he can carry gifts to heaven, and heaven's gifts can pass down to the earth, even though he's going to be weak, he's been weak so many times, and he's going to fight with an angel, and the angel's going to give him to take away his strength for the rest of his life, but he's going to be a great priest, and there's going to be a mystery of the priesthood by which the priests shall many of them be wicked, many of them be evil, many of them turn against God because they hate the crucifixion. They hate the idea of having to be a priest and a victim. They're terrified of it, and they want someone else to be the victim. Caiaphas wanted Christ to be the victim. Judas wanted Christ to be the victim. He didn't want to be a victim. And when it turned out the way he didn't expect, he didn't want it to go that bad. He wanted 30 pieces of silver. He thought Christ would somehow get away. But Christ didn't get away. It didn't go like he expected. And he despaired. And he made the greatest mistake that anyone can make. He committed suicide too soon. If he only waited a few hours, the Blessed Virgin Mary would have saved him. If he waited only a few hours, he would have been able to repent. Only waited a few hours, but he couldn't do it because he repented unto himself. He did not repent unto God. Therefore, he went to death and hung himself by the halter. And what did he hang himself by? A rope that came from, the, from an ass. A rope that came from a donkey. That's where he hung himself from. Because the priest is supposed to be a donkey. He should have a rope tied to his teeth. The rope is supposed to be tied to the man on the back, which is Jesus Christ. And it's supposed to go wherever Christ wants him to go. But he didn't go the way Christ wanted him to go. He didn't do what Christ wanted him to do. He rotted like that dead donkey. Because he didn't have the love of God in his heart. He didn't like the sacrifice of the Mass. He didn't he was scandalized by Christ's ways. And therefore he was a dead donkey. What did he do? He took the very halter, which was supposed to be his means to heaven. And he tied it around his own neck. Tied itself to a tree and committed suicide. And this is the case of everyone that goes to hell. Everyone that goes to hell. Not only the priest, but everyone that goes to hell. Ties their own rope around their own neck. And brings about their own death. No one can blame it on the devil. No one can blame it on the Bilderbergers. No one can blame it on the wicked men of the church or our neighbors in any way. The death comes to us because of our turning away from God. Our turning away from the cross. That's the cause of death. In any case, the mystery of Judas, he works hard today. Meanwhile, St. Peter and St. James and St. John sleep. They are sad. They are worried. They don't have the strength to watch one hour. Therefore, the church asks of us, can we not make up the hour? Just watch one hour of Christ. During the time in which you're locked up at home, can't go to work, you can set aside an hour every day. So right now, it's 
Eight zero zero. That's an easy one. Mm -hmm. Eight o'clock. Sixty minutes later is nine. Set aside an hour. An hour with Christ. During that hour, say a rosary. During that hour, read a spiritual book. During that hour, just sit there and do like the wise farmer did in St. John Vianney's church. You just come out of his confessional and say his breviary. Go back for 16 hours and saw that man there all day. He said, what are you doing? What do you say to God while you're here in the church? And the old farmer said, I don't say anything to God. Well, then what do you do? He says, I look at him and he looks at me. And St. John said, that's fine. You keep doing that. You don't always have to speak. But spend 60 minutes looking at Christ. Let him look at you. Say a rosary. Say another rosary. Read a little bit of the invitation of Christ. Set aside exactly 60 minutes. 8.01. Now it's 8.01. Everyone's waiting for this to end. 8.01 <laughs> until 9.01. Super long mass. One hour. And then when the hour is complete, exactly 60 minutes, and you can go about your business. During that time, be with Christ. Make it part of your schedule. Could you not watch one hour with me? Judas was busy. He had to do a lot of things, gathering up the mob, going and selling the, 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 the sell, selling themselves to the priests, getting everything prepared, worrying about everything, rocking up the mountain, going into the out and he had to do so many things. And Christ asked of us just one thing. 60 minutes. 60 minutes in Christ's presence. 60 minutes talking to him. 60 minutes looking at him. 60 minutes just being looked at by him. Saying a little rosary. Reading a little prayers to the breviary. A little time with Christ. Do it every day during this so-called crisis. Especially though you're not working. You don't work anywhere you do work, but you now you're not officially work. And then simply do something for Christ in 60 minutes. It's the most beautiful thing. Exact time. Now it's 8.02. Still 8.02. 8.03. Not bad. We'll end in the second here. 8.03. And you continue until 9.03. And that is your hour. So in any case, that's all that Christ asked. One hour. And that's enough to comfort him. And then he goes happily to a terrible death for our sakes. Because he loves us. And St. John says that he loved them. Each and every one. And he loved them unto the end. We must remember that Christ does love us, but for how long? Unto the end. It's also the beautiful words quoted by the Council of Trent and the Gospel of St. Luke today. He said, what's conversion? Conversion is what happened to St. Peter after he denied Christ three times. He denied Christ three times. And at the end of those three times, what happened? Conversus Dominum. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Peter did not convert. What are we waiting for? Are we waiting for everybody in the world to convert? Are we waiting for the Pope to convert? Waiting for the priest to convert? Waiting for me to convert? We've been waiting for a long time. Let's wait for Christ to turn his face and look at us. Wait for Christ to convert and look at us. And one day he's going to turn. He's going to look. And then we're going to remember how terrible are our sins. Then we're going to remember how much we must turn back to him. And then we're the Pope is most wicked will return away from his wickedness and remember that he must weep bitterly. And then he will obey heaven and consecrate Russia back out of Mary. And remember a priest is like a, is like a pilot on an airplane, as I mentioned many times. He flies jet airplanes, he shoots all kinds of nuclear missiles and blows up the enemy. But he can't do it unless someone puts the bombs on the plane, missiles on the plane. Unless someone hands him a little hamburger before he gets to the plane, takes off. Unless somebody fixes the car, fixes the plane, makes it work. Unless there's an aircraft carrier with 3,000 guys on it making sure it works. Then he can get in the plane and go. You can't say, oh, I'm not a pilot. I'm not going to sweep the runway. I'm not a pilot. I'm not making him breakfast. I'm not a pilot. I'm not putting missiles in the plane. I'm not a pilot. I'm not fixing it. It's not my problem. Pilot problem. No, we're all in this battlefield together. Don't follow the rules like they say now. Notice the demonic words. We're all in this together. Stay apart. Mm. <laughs> Did that make sense? You can change your medication. Mm. <laughs> now the fact is that that's not what it means to be together. That isn't what it means. Let's try something else. Let's try embracing that holy cross. Try embracing Christ with all our hearts. Let's try to have confidence in him. And that this hour of tragedy, and the hour of suffering, and the hour of difficulties, it's only an hour. 
and it will pass. And there shall be a day of victory of Christ, and a day of resurrection, and it shall never end. There will be no ending of the day, but the hour passes. And in this hour, what's the best way to spend it? With Christ. 60 minutes each day, just with Christ. These are beautiful minutes, doing anything but being with Him. And this has the grace to do that, to imitate Christ, especially in the sacred triduum. And we'll close with that. And God bless you all then, and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.